All right, so welcome to another interview for this Australian uh, speculative fiction interview series, uh, this time with uh, Alan Baxter, is who I'm joined with. And, and as you know, I'm Lucas Madela, uh, one of your lecturers for this series. Uh, so we're going to just jump right in with our first question, which is uh, about speculative fiction, since that is kind of the topic of our, our whole thing. Uh, and we're wondering, would you label your own writing as Australian speculative fiction? Um, yes, more so now than it used to be. Um, I've recently kind of embraced the Australian aspect of it a lot more than I did before. Um, I've written novels with Australian protagonists that travel around the world, and I've written novels set in America and set in the UK and short stories and things the same. Um, but yeah, I've recently been very much enjoying the, the Australian angle, especially because I had a bit of a surprise runaway success with a crazy novella called The Roo which was about as Australian as it gets about this the demonic killer kangaroo in an outback town. Uh, and it was that popular that I thought, well, far out, maybe people are going to be interested in Australian stories. So I embrace it even more so now. So you kind of, uh, kind of evolved, I guess, in, in that sense then. So, so like initially you were writing more books that were just set all over or, or were you more yeah. focused on, on Britain or more focused on America? Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm an immigrant. Um, to Australia. So yep. I, mean, I was born and grew up in the UK and then I've been an Australian for more than 20 years now. So I feel very much sort of at home here and I know Australian life and culture very well, but I always, I think, sort of see it from that perspective of an outsider because I didn't grow up here. Um, so that always informs the work. Um, and I'd like to set things in a lot of different places, but then so much um, fiction in English is set in the UK or the US and it's like well we need to broaden our own horizons as much as we can and our readers horizons and so yeah I, uh, I'm, I've set stuff all over the place so a lot of the time it'll be set in the city or you know non-specific could be London could be New York could be Sydney doesn't really matter um, but setting is often such a key part of story and such a character in story that uh, now when when I'm thinking about that, I try more often to make it Australian than not. So, yeah. And so when you make something Australian, how does that actually change it or make it different than if it is set in, say, Britain or, or America? Well, in many ways, that's the beauty of it, because the, the core of the story um, doesn't necessarily change. I mean, my, last, my latest book is a series of five interconnected novellas that are set in an isolated Australian harbour town where the town is very much central to the stories and the characters and everything that goes on. Um, so if you did, if you did, if I wrote those in a different city or a different town or a different country, that would have an effect on how those stories work because the, you know, Australian culture and language and that sort of Australian sensibility weaves through the stories. But then equally, the stuff that happens in those stories could happen in other places. But the stories might, you know, they would change. They would come out differently. Characters would think they react a little differently because of that different culture so it's a bit like trying to unscramble an egg it's hard to know how things how things will play out but uh, and I think that's why I've recently been making a point of leaning into Australian stories a lot more because there's so much to be tapped from that and so much to explore and it's my home and now and there's not enough stories from here so yeah I'm kind of making the most of it I think. Yeah, and I, I do think, and I think in general, we've kind of noticed that there's been a, a stronger trend in the Australian speculative kind of fiction writers block, so to speak, that uh, they've been more focused on on making things more Australian or more authentically Australian. And we're wondering, because um, it is often overlooked internationally, like this, the idea of Australian writers, a lot of times they'll just be kind of uh, just listed as writers or like global writers or something like that. Uh, but more commonly, you know, there's been a little bit more spotlight now uh, internationally with regard to to writers as Australian. Uh, but even so, we still feel like, uh, at least in Germany, where, you know, where we're kind of coming from here, uh, we still feel like we don't really know as much as we should about Australian fiction. Um, so we're wondering if you have any favorites or, or recommendations uh, from Australian authors. Yeah, sure. I mean, especially in speculative fiction, it's often... Um, like if you're writing second world fantasy, like Trudy Canavan, who's a massive international seller, she's Australian, she lives in Melbourne, or, you know, Greg Egan, who writes the most amazing hard science fiction, 
but you wouldn't necessarily know who was Australian because, you know, set in the far future in space and stuff like that. So, you know, yeah. that, that Australian sensibility might come through, but if you don't recognise it, you wouldn't know. Um, with stuff like, you know, the sort of horror and dark fantasy stuff that I do that's a lot more contemporary, I can set in current day Australia and then it becomes a lot more of a, um, a thing. And it's, it's really those... So, you know, there are Garth Nix is another one who's a you know massive international seller, amazing writer. Um, writes this, you know all sorts of great fantasy and horror and YA fantasy and stuff like that. Um, and again, a great Australian author that people should be reading, but not necessarily specifically Australian content. Um, but then there are authors <clears throat> who people really should be reading, uh, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Amazing Australian authors. Karen Warren is one, K W A R O N. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, her work is just outstanding, and some of that is so, um, so subtly Australian, not overtly, but the sensibility is very much there. Angela Slater um, is a tremendous writer, and she writes these sort of twisted fantasy fairy tales, but she's got a whole uh, dark urban fantasy trilogy set in Brisbane. Very Australian story. Um, Trent Jameson is another one. He's got, um, a, again, another sort of horror fantasy kind of story set in Brisbane. He's also a Brisbane writer. Uh, but he also wrote an amazing book called Dayboy, um, which, again, does, is not really sort of specific in place, but it went, if you're Australian, you can sort of go, this is an Aussie author here at work. And Trent Jameson's an amazing author. He's somebody else I think people should be reading. Uh, Lisa Hannett, Lisa L. Hannett, she writes that. She's uh, actually Canadian, uh, but like me, she's been Australian for a long time. Uh, and she's a tremendous writer. She's, a, she's another one that I think people should be following up with. Kat Spark writes fantastic short stories in particular. She has a, one novel out that's a very Australian post-apocalyptic story. It's a bit like sort of uh, Mad Max meets Ghost in the Shell. It's quite a thing that's called Lotus Blue. Um, but her short stories are often very Australian as well, worth looking at. And Rob Hood um, is another great horror writer whose stories are unashamedly Australian, suburban Australian horror, which is quite a thing. So, I, I mean, I could go on and on. There's, there's, we, we punch above our weight when it comes to the number of quality writers, especially genre writers, that we've got I, in Australia. I, definitely. And I feel like we uh, definitely some of our listeners will know some of those names, but I think that just shows once again, uh, we asked this question to, to basically everyone in this interview series and there's always new names. Uh, there's yeah. always other writers who are making great content out there. And uh, honestly, uh, if, if you have any, any more, if you just send them to us via email, we'd be super happy to, to list those all. Yeah, remind, uh, send me an email to remind me and I'll send you a list. Cause yeah, we, we've got some, we've got some legends here doing really yeah. amazing work. Regarding your own influences, then, uh, do you have any influences uh, or works of fiction that especially inspired you, uh, whether they were Australian or otherwise? Um, I do, absolutely. I mean, a lot of my influences uh, and early inspirations were while I was still growing up in the UK. Um, so by far, Clive Barker is probably the most influential author on, on me and my writing. It's um, He's sort of standout, my, probably still my favourite author. His work just blows my mind. Um, and I was also a huge fan of fantasy in my teens, and so people like um, Anne McCaffrey and uh, Carol Nelson Douglas and people like that, and Ursula Le Guin especially, had a huge influence on me. But I used to read a lot of comic books as well, so I got a lot of influence from um, especially sort of mid to late 80s comic books, stuff like uh, Alan Moore with uh, Watchmen and Beauty Vendetta, and Jamie Delano's Hellblazer run especially was something that just open my eyes wide and Neil Gaiman's uh, Sandman series at the time I, I bought that issue by issue as it came out I went to the comic store to, to pick up my weekly order and there was this young long-haired dude there promoting his new comic and it was Sandman number one I'd never heard of him or any of it I've still got the copy signed by him and Dave McKean who did the cover art um, and that was kind of even before he'd really grown up into much at the time and so those those sort of mid late 80s comic books were a massive influence on me so and then, you know, the horror boom of the 70s and 80s, people like Ramsey Campbell and James Herbert, and, you know, King to some degree um, as well, but that's sort of more sort of enduring. But those, those, um, those kind of horror writers, the paperback horror writers of the 80s were a big influence as well. 
And do you feel that there's been like influences that you just keep coming back to? Are there, are there any books that you go back to and you, you just keep reading and, and drawing from or? It, yeah. I mean, there's so many, I tend to not reread much, but um, I do every few years reread um, Le Guin's Wizard, Wizard of Earth series. I, I just love those books so much that I reread those every once in a while. Just her command of language is just mind blowing. You learn more about writing every time you read it. Um, there's totally. a couple of King, Stephen King books that I really enjoy. Pet Cemetery, I've read a few times now. It's probably my favourite Stephen King book. Um, and I revisit Clive Barker a lot. Um, the, uh, the Books of Blood, his sort of six volumes of short stories, are still among the best short story collections ever. Um, and I frequently revisit those as well. Now, you already touched a bit on, on comics and, and talking about, for example, Alan Moore, Alan Moore and uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, effects on you. Uh, but what about uh, other non-literary influences? Are there any like films or, or television series even that kind of uh, inspire you or, or other kinds of art? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm frequently being told that I write very cinematically, um, which, is, which is true, I guess, because I've, I've, I do have a huge influence from movies. I've just been a, a movie fan since forever. And there's some, you know, outstanding Blade Runner. I think I still think is the greatest movie ever made. Um, I I have no idea how many times I've seen that film, dozens and dozens of times. Uh, but there's films like uh, Dark City and The Thing and The Crow and things like that. Those were seminal movies for me um, growing up, and numerous other films that have touched one way or another. I'm a martial artist as well. Like I teach kung fu my day job. Um, so there's a whole plethora of classic um, sort of Shaw Brothers flicks. From, the, from Hong Kong in the 70s and 80s that uh, I frequently revisit. And that tends to, you know, I don't tend to write as uh, sort of slapstick and crazy as that stuff, but that kind of vibe definitely informs a lot of what I do as well. Because, yeah, you know, they're, they're again, seminal while I was growing up as much as I'm still watching today. So. Then uh, does that martial arts influence also come into your writing at all when you write fight scenes and stuff like that? Or... Yeah, not, I, I, mean, I can't I, really I, recall too many in in Crowshine, for example, but I'm no, sure there there are throughout your writing. Yeah, yeah, not so much in the short stories. There's not much in Crowshine, especially. Um, but the the Alex Kane series, which is a dark urban fantasy series that I wrote for Harper Collins in Australia, um, the main character is a is a mixed martial artist, and he just gets his world turned upside down with magic and monsters and all this sort of dark weirdness that goes on. Uh, but that was me just just leaning right into that because people kept saying, you know, you write these great fight scenes. So it's like, well, I might as well write a character who's a fighter. And I've, I've run a workshop on writing fight scenes lots of times. So it does crop up a lot more in my novels and some novella stuff, um, not as much in the short story. But uh, but it kind of bleeds into all sort of action themes regardless. So, yeah, I, I'm sure the influence is there, even if it's not actually a fighting scene. All right. So regarding your own... Not not only your own influences, but I guess uh, the influence you might have on readers. Then, uh, what do you kind of see as the role of your your literature or or the work uh, that you make, short stories, uh, novellas, novels? Um, I, I, it's tricky. It's dangerous to sort of think that um, in some ways it's dangerous to think that you've got some great wisdom to impart or anything like that. Um, I, I always write first and foremost with a view to entertainment. It's like I, I want people to just sit back and enjoy a story. Anything else they get from it, on top of that, that's that's gravy. That's good. But um, but there does always seem to be themes that come through my work. Um, I'm always very heavily sort of influenced by ideas of justice and consequences, um, and I I seem to play a lot with the idea of, of death and. The, the justice or injustice of death and how that sort of played. I mean, Devouring Dark is a novel I wrote that the whole book is basically a meditation on the nature of death and what's fair and unfair about it, set up in this kind of urban horror crime novel. So, yeah, there's a lot of themes that I do, um, that I do explore. I mean, that, that's kind of how writing works for me. It's like, you know, I want to tell a fun and entertaining story and give people a thrill ride. Um, but I can't help but explore these things that, that occur to me as well. I mean, like with the Rue, it's just a crazy gonzo creature feature about a demonic kangaroo decimating an outback town, but it's also exploring themes of um, isolation and domestic violence in Australia, which is, which, is a, which is a big thing. It's a big problem here, especially in rural communities. So I think I'm always, to some degree, 
communicating something, but I often don't know what it is. Um, I might get to the end of the story and then be, oh, okay, that's what that's about. You know, I, I recognize the thing after I've had fun writing the story. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I completely respect that position. I, I think it's a pretty humble way, actually, to to think about it. Uh, there are certainly a lot of authors who who push like a kind of authorial intent, uh, maybe like J.K. Rowling being among the most famous in, in current pop culture. Um, but I, I definitely can see where you're coming from. And and obviously, it is an entertainment medium, right? Uh, yeah, I, mean, is... I think if we explore honestly the, the story and the characters that we're dealing with, then we end up hopefully exploring honestly the themes as well. And then you know, with any luck, people see themselves reflected in the story and in the characters, and it gives them pause to think about stuff. And I might not be smart enough to even realize what it is I'm doing, but somebody hopefully gets something from it, you know? So, yeah, yeah. And and unlike a lot of writers, you're not exactly like in one niche. Like, even if we called you a dark fantasy writer or something like that, that wouldn't really be accurate because you really write a lot of different stuff. Um, like you write short stories, novellas, novels, and you, you, as you've already mentioned, you write mystery, you write fantasy, you write, uh, you write stories that are, are kind of all over the place. And I'm wondering, like, what's different when it comes to the writing process when you approach something or a narrative? Like, how, how do you kind of decide if it's a short story that you're writing or a novel? Well, it's a good question. Sometimes I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I've said it before. Yeah, no, I've never met a genre that I, I didn't like. So I do tend to mash them up most of the time. I Generally, I write horror and dark fantasy, and usually there's threads of crime fiction sort of woven into that. And it kind of branches in and out um, sometimes. More often than not, for me, a novel will be, if I've got a few ideas that all sort of seem to complement each other and they kind of come together, that's a big enough thing to be a novel. If it's just one or two ideas or one particular sort of scene or something that's in mind that I want to explore, that will quite often be a short story. But it, sometimes I don't know. I wrote Manifest Recall is the first of a novella series I've been writing for Grey Matter Press. Um, and they're about sort of 35,000, 40,000 word uh, novellas. Um, the second one's out and I'm working on the third now. But when I started that, I thought I was writing a short story and the scene I had in mind and the idea I was going to go with, with I thought was a short story. And then I started writing it and I was like, oh, wow, actually, this, this is way bigger. I've got a lot more I can do with this. Maybe this is a novel. Um, and then it turned out to be a novella. It's done in the middle. So, and, but then it, it's become a series of novellas because the publisher's keen and readers have been keen. So, you know, now I've got this idea where I can write these kind of pulp novellas with about 40,000 words each and, and hopefully I have a running series of them. Um, so yeah, I, sometimes sometimes I don't know. Normally I know if it's going to be a short story or a novella, uh, sorry, a short story or a novel, uh, and often the novellas are the ones that couldn't quite make up their mind and they, it turns out, oh, actually that's a novella. <laughs> so yeah. Do you typically kind of outline them or or are you more of a, a kind of writer who, who grows into it as you just kind of have these ideas in your in your head? Yeah, a bit of both, really. I've described myself in the past as a signpost writer rather than uh, an, an outliner. So, um, I, I do some co-writing with David Wood and that's very, very planned, very, we, we you know, we work a lot before we start writing and, and we, we come up, we have a very solid chapter by chapter plan because there's two people working on the same book. You know, uh, but with my own stuff, usually I will have a premise, characters, a few key points, a few key beats that I want to hit, hit along the way. And those are the signposts. And how I get between them is the organic process. I don't know where it's going to go. And sometimes I think I'm aiming for this signpost and suddenly it all changes. It's, oh, okay. And I, I'll shift everything around. That by makes a lot of sense. Book, by halfway through the book, I've kind of got a better idea of where it's going often. So... But yes, I'm kind of, I, I think the sort of people who, who just wing it and people who plan in great detail, I think that's a sliding scale and everybody sort of is somewhere on that scale and quite often the same person will be in different places on that scale with different books and different projects. So that, that's, yeah. that's true for me. And, then, and when you talk about working with, uh, with another, another author, right, David Wood, uh, it kind of makes sense that you'd probably be more, more outlining, I guess. Uh, just because you are two writers and uh, yeah. when that does happen when you do a co-author a book are there any other kind of effects on the process then well I mean we've been doing it for a while now we've written quite a few books together Dave and I um, and we've actually got a sort of a, a method a system set down now that works quite well 
Um, what, what it really boils down with the sort of stuff that we write, he and I, we do these sort of action adventure stories, like as, as Dave once described, it's like the Da Vinci Code book good. Um, that, that's the sort of Jake Crowley stories. And then we do um, the Sam Aston series, which is sort of monster thrillers. Um, and we've realized that we, we, you know, we both have very complementary styles, but when it comes to it, Dave's really good um, at plotting um, and figuring out the, the, the sort of the story beats. Um, whereas I'm probably better at the sort of prose and character generation in, in the first draft. So we've got to the point now where we'll talk something backwards and forwards and we'll Skype or Zoom like this. We'll have, you know, hours of chat figuring out what, what and ping ideas around. And then he'll go, right, go away and write what we call draft 0 0.5, which is pretty much a spreadsheet with a chapter by chapter plan. But this happens and this happens and this happens. And we, we then we'll bounce that back and forth until we're happy with how we think the story's going to go. And then he'll just go off and work on something else. And I'll sit down and write the entire first draft of the book from that plan. Um, and then once the draft is written, then we bounce that back and forth. And, you know, if things change and by the end, you're not entirely sure which of us wrote quite which bit. But, um, but that works for us now. That, you know, that's a system that works pretty well. Um, so I don't know how other people do it, but that's how we do it, which is obviously nothing like the way that I do my own work when I'm just, you know, writing my own thing. It's just me sitting in here doing my thing and I don't have much in the way of a plan and I make notes and I change things and whatever, because I'm only answering to myself. So. Well, you, even so, I noticed that you tend to uh, basically publish a lot of your short stories uh, to podcast uh, quite a bit. Like you, you allow them to be uh, read on various podcasts or... Uh, they're released in, in podcast form or other audio forms. And I'm wondering then, does that ever come up when you're writing the story? Do you ever think about like how it might be uh, read aloud or is that? No, no, I never do. Um, the, for me, obviously making any kind of living as a writer is a hell of a difficult thing to do. Um, and one of the best ways that you can help to improve income is with resale stuff. So often with short fiction, um, almost all the time for me the podcasts are reprints so you'll sell the story to a magazine or, or an anthology or something like that and you get paid for the story in the first publication and then when you get the rights back you can sell it as a reprint and a lot of a lot of print mediums aren't so keen on reprints unless you like you know if you're a big name like king or whatever um, but a lot of podcasts are happy that if it's been in print somewhere but it hasn't been audio they're happy to take, so you kind of get paid again for the same story and then you get enough stories together and you can put together a collection and then you've got a book to sell as well. So, you know, this is a good way that short fiction can can keep, basically keep earning you money, but also keep reaching new readers, which, you know, at the end of the day, as a writer, what we really want more than anything else is, is more readers, you know, more sales or more awards or whatever, it's all very good. But what you really want are more readers. And so for me, Pretty much everything that has been podcast is something that's been published somewhere else. Um, and then I'll approach podcasters or they'll, they'll approach me for reprints and then it gets published again in that format. So I get paid again and hopefully reach new readers and hopefully, you know, maybe grab a few more fans and, and the slow career sort of can get, can, continues its slow build. So, but, but I never write with, um, with podcast in mind. So sometimes I do wonder how things will come across when they're done that way. So, I mean, this is something we talk about quite a bit in, in literary studies is the market's effect on all kinds of uh, different choices and directions uh, we take our, our literature. And you've already kind of uh, mentioned how uh, Australian authenticity has uh, has kind of been like a shift in your career a bit, partially because of the market, right? And when we think yeah, of we, your own... Yeah. yeah, and when we think of your own uh, work where you do kind of do genre mixing quite a bit and uh, you do have... I, I would say a pretty a pretty rare niche in in dark uh, horror and fantasy. I, I don't think there's really a huge amount of authors writing in that in comparison to some of the the other more uh, more pulpy genres. I'm wondering kind of how did you decide to to write uh, a lot of a lot of dark darker work? Uh, it wasn't really a conscious decision to be honest. I, I I would to be honest, I was quite surprised early on in my career when a lot of people started referring to me as a horror writer because. Um, I, as far as I sort of concerned, I wrote, you know, dark fantasy and supernatural thrillers. Um, and you know what, it, it is dark and I am a horror writer. I kind of embrace it now. I recognize it's true, but I never really saw 
I didn't really store that um, when I first did. I just kind of naturally wrote stories that naturally tend towards dark. Um, I think it's a sort of a very honest genre when you when, with dark fiction because you know you don't have to provide the happy endings or that you don't have to always provide sort of um, you know conclusions or you know wrap things up in in a good way or whatever. You know you you've got a bit more free reign to go. But it just seems to be the way that I that I naturally go. I tend to with when when I write, even if I write something that I think is quite an upbeat story, it tends to lean towards the dark end of the scale before I get towards the end of it. So I guess it's just something I can't avoid. I can't I can't really explain it. It's not really a conscious ever, but it is something that I enjoy reading, and it's definitely something that I seem to get the most um, sort of satisfaction from writing. Right. I, I mean, I think that's a that's a great reason. Uh, certainly, it does free you up pretty narratively because when we do think of darker work, it doesn't have to have that that resolution that is typical of so many other uh, genre forms, basically. Um, so yeah, we're I, really, I can see where you're coming really, through from. Yeah, we're really conditioned, um, especially in Western literary culture. We're really conditioned to expect a resolution, to expect a happy ending, and um, it's not necessarily life isn't like that even if something good does happen there's other stuff that's still going on you know life continues on stuff. so a lot of the time with novels i do tend to at least try to wrap things up relatively well um and not just be completely nihilistic in novels because if someone invests like 10 12 hours of time in something they don't want to be left feeling completely battered by it but the beauty of shorter fiction novellas and short stories means that when you're taking less time from a person you can kind of treat them intellectually a little bit more roughly you know so when you have a short story that is pretty bleak or dark or whatever people will go along for that ride because it's not something they're going to have to sort of be with for you know you sit and read a novel you might be reading the same thing for a week and it might you know bring you down but if you're going to read a short story in half an hour you can you can allow yourself to be a bit battered by it um and yeah and so that i think it's honest in that respect it's especially in shorter fiction and and the novella length particularly, I think, is a fantastic medium for horror, for, for that reason, among others. That sort of horror fiction where you can expand on a bigger idea than a short story, but you don't have to stretch it out to the length of a novel is, is really fantastic, I think, for, for horror as a genre. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a really useful length. And I, I know that uh, when I was reading the, the Crowshine collection, and it was kind of originally marketed or advertised in, in at least in, in the way that I received it, um, as kind of dark fantasy and horror. And I'm kind of curious because I feel like a lot of the stories uh, vary in like what I would consider horror versus not. And I'm wondering how you kind of decide when you're writing, uh, you said yourself already that like you didn't intend, I guess, to be a horror writer so much as as a dark fantasy or supernatural writer. But uh, when you do write uh, horrific elements into your stories, uh, how do you kind of decide uh, what is uh, ho horror, I guess? I, I guess I don't. Um, in some ways it's, it's kind of for readers to decide. Um, I, I don't really sort of set out to write horror. I, or I set out to write the stories that I want to write that invariably do tend to, as we've discussed, you know, sort of lean into the dark side of things. And um, I, I love to play with that whole idea of like sort of magic and demons and monsters and, and you know, this cosmic insignificance, um, which is a, a you know, frequently running theme through some of my work. Um, but, but I don't really, I, I recognize that, yes, I am a horror writer, um, as much as I'm a crime writer or a fantasy writer, but I don't actively set out to write horror. I just set out to write the story that I want to, and some turn out more dark than others. And so some end up being classed as dark fantasy and others end up being classed as horror because of the way they come out. And one person's horror is not another person's, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it, for, for, you know, my... There's a, there's a few of my things that my wife refuses to read because she, you know, she gets a few pages in and she's like, no, nah, I'm not doing that because she, she, she can't go as dark as I, you know, as I can. But for other people, they're like, oh, this is fantastic, you know, and they complain that you didn't go dark enough. So, <laughs> you know, the idea that, you yeah, know, horror is a genre. Horror really is a flavor. It's a spice that you add to a story. In the same way, you do the same thing with comedy. You know, you could take any basic story idea and make it funny and you could take any basic story idea and make it you know terrifying it's it's uh, yeah so people like different amounts of chili in their food and horror is a bit like that i think 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I would tend to agree as well, and I certainly think there are there are elements of humor in a lot of uh, horror and and so on, and I think maybe that's why uh, your genre mixing approach tends to work so well is because you have you have a good mastery of of kind of the different flavors that you can mix together and and that can actually produce a, a consistent work basically. Yeah, um, well, thank. That's a lot of what um, authors finding their voice is about as well. When you find you know, again, to use the food analogy, when you find the ingredients that you like to use and you get good at mixing those things, then, uh, yeah, and I think that to some degree that's what the development of that authorial voice is like. And so hopefully you get to a point, like for myself, hopefully people are like, oh, you know, this is an Alan Baxter story before it's a horror or a fantasy or whatever else. I mean, that's, you know, that would be ideal. You know, we know when we're reading Barker, we know when we're reading King. So hopefully, you know, we all get to that point. Yeah, I remember seeing on your on your website there was a comparison that was like Stephen King meets uh, Jim Butcher, and I was thinking to myself like, how is that possible? <laughs> uh, yeah. But I I think that that really illustrates a uh, uh, kind of part of your repertoire. Really, you can really write detective fiction, you can write humorous scenes, you can write uh, horrific scenes, you can write uh, true true variety, and um, if we zoom in on just one short story uh, at a time here for for a moment. Um, sure. In Crowshine, I was I was really intrigued about how uh, the moonshine uh, essentially uh, affects the story and how how it creates this uh, kind of performative structure. So it's kind of a crutch that Clyde relies on in order to perform. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm wondering if that was kind of intended to be a kind of broader commentary on how addiction itself is often used to uh, to perform uh, a certain way. Uh, such as when people, uh, you know, take, you know, go go to the club and, and drink some alcohol to uh, loosen up or something like that, or in order to be, you know, a functioning alcoholic in, in some way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to some degree, I think it is. Uh, again, not really consciously at the time of writing, but um, as I find, I frequently recognize these themes of consequence um, um, through my work. I'm, a very, I'm very much a believer of that people need to own what they do and you need to accept the consequences of what you do and stop looking for scapegoats, stop looking for people to blame. Um, and so a lot of my stories will be um, things like, you know, people playing around with magic and facing the consequences or people doing this or that or the other. Um, and I tend to then inadvertently at the time and maybe recognise it later, play with other more mundane themes along a similar a vibe and, and Crowshine is definitely one of those where um, it, it definitely sort of indirectly touches on themes of, of performative addiction, um, which is which is definitely a thing. I mean, thankfully I've never been an addict, but I have been around the the music scene and the heavy metal scene and stuff, and I played in bands and was a roadie and stuff like that. So I've I've seen a lot of that stuff. And uh, I've seen a lot of people who did, you know, succumb to various addictions over the, over the years, you know, places that I've been. So, uh, yeah, I think those things do tend to sort of come through a little bit in the work, and it tends to be the background. And then, the, uh, you know, um, with that with, with that story with Crow Shine, it's you know, the guy inherits this uh, effectively this amazing talent from his grandfather, who people you know don't realise really what that cost of that talent was because you know, they keep secret why they're as good as they are. And there's that whole idea that, you know, people, you know, he, he was always a happy one. He was always so pleased and jolly and nobody knew quite why he was always so happy when he was always high or he was always drunk or whatever. So, you know, these, these yeah. themes, these things they tend to play through. So, yeah, that that, that story definitely, it, it, there, was, there was no intentional um, idea to, to highlight addiction. Uh, but I think performative addiction is, uh, a good term um, to explore, basically, because there, there is a lot of the time people are addicted to the thing, not because of the thing, but because of what the thing allows them to do. So, yeah, and yeah, I, I think that's quite insightful, actually, because I, I really think a lot of times people focus on uh, the high or something like that, uh, yeah. that addiction in, in a narrative can have. But here we, we really see that a lot of it is about not how it makes someone feel, but what it allows them to do. Yeah, and I think that's true. And it's my experience with, um, you know, around the edges of that with people who've had those issues as well. You know, they can hate the thing that they're addicted to, but they love what, you know, what it 
sort of provide for them. So, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a sticky and tricky sort of subject to explore, but it, it's uh, like all these things, there's many layers and depth to it. Absolutely. And uh, if, if we zoom in on a different story for a bit, um, mm. All the Wealth in the, in the World, which is also uh, a part of the collection, um, you present uh, a kind of idea that I think really resonates with a lot of people, which is kind of like ideas of regret and, and loss and how if we could give up some of our time, or in this case, uh, memories, uh, would we do that and what would we do? And I, I think what's really telling in the story is even after this whole process kind of has gone through, uh, the protagonist of, of that particular uh, short story gives up uh, a month of their time to uh, to forget uh, their their loved one, uh, their abusive loved one. Um, and I'm wondering that if that sense of loss and grief, even after kind of uh, forgetting about it or moving on, I guess, in, in one way or form, if if that connection uh, kind of, where, where does that kind of come from? Because I, I really think that it is a powerful one. Uh, but if you just elaborate a bit on that, I, I would Love yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm unfortunately, I suppose, during the course of my life, I've experienced a lot of um, death of, in people and family and loved ones around me. Like, there's been a bunch, of, a lot of terminal illness and things like that that have just been around me, um, which is probably why I'm constantly fascinated with exploring these subjects of death and grief and recovery and whatever else. But there's always that thing that um, that has always really resonated with me with that idea that if you if you run away from your problems, it doesn't matter how far you run or where you go, because when you get there, the problems are still there. Um, and so, with with that story, with all the work in the world, it, it's really you know the ultimate opportunity to to run away from something. You know, you can you can give up some some time to for a thing to have never happened, but there would still be that huge dissatisfaction because even if you took away this thing that's causing you so much grief and pain, that hole would then be a new thing to grieve. And so like, well, what could possibly, if you didn't know what you'd given up, what could possibly be so bad that I had to give it up? And we, you know, we don't, we don't believe ourselves a lot of the time, but the, this is often the case, you know, this is where things like anxiety and stuff come from. You listen to the voices in your head. Um, and, and, you know, you know better, but you don't believe yourself. And so, yeah, again, it's that sort of, that, that temptation and, and consequence of what could go, if you did have this ultimate power what would you, and you used it for that, would, would you really benefit from it? Or is it better to just, you know, listen to yourself and be honest with what's happened around you, accept your world and try to, you know, live with it rather than change it. Obviously, there's a lot in the world that we should change if we can. Uh, but there's yeah. a lot of things that we can't. And you know, things like grief, that's not the sort of thing you can change. You can't bring people back. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that really connects well with uh, a lot of kind of the idea of, of just people meditating and questioning, you know, the meaning of stories as they read them, uh, as they're enjoying them, you know, they're, they're still questioning, you know, like, oh, this yeah. just made me think of something different. And it mm. kind of is asking almost when you reflect, you know, that in itself is a process that we should maybe reflect on a bit, which is like, even if we do make a decision, we know it's the best decision. It is true that we can be conflicted about these things. Even if we had the power to absolutely erase uh, our memories of grief and maybe even that's the right decision, we would still maybe feel conflicted about it. Right. Yeah. And I, and, I think and that's. Yeah. It's really worth obviously bearing in mind another thing um, that resonates with me a lot that I kind of explore quite often as well is that idea that just because you can ask the question doesn't mean there's an answer. Um, and that, you know, that plays through into ideas of religion and stuff like that as well. And, you know, people trying to provide an answer for something that might not have one um, is a massive driving force for us as humans, apart from anything else. This is where a lot of sort of science and advancement and stuff comes from is by asking these questions. So I think it's dangerous to always assume there's an answer or to always assume there's a solution. Um, whereas, you know, trying to trigger that solution might just create a new set of problems. So, yeah. Yeah, and while, while your work typically doesn't like give us a kind of resolution or catharsis, because you do you do often leave us with questions to think about. Uh, yeah, at least in they, like, they, everything they, they, I, I've read of yours so far. Um, with, with a couple exceptions, like in Tiny Lives, I would say you do have a kind of resolution uh, 
in a sense. And I'm kind of I'm kind of curious about that because uh, you you as you've already said you're a, you're a migrant. I as well am one, and mm-hmm. that story centers on a uh, a Thai uh, seemingly migrant character as well, uh, who's selling kind of their their breath or like their parts of their soul or something like that, um, in order to support their family. And I'm wondering if there's any connection to that and your own experience as a migrant or. Or what? Because it is it is one of those stories with a resolution as well, which I think is intriguing. Yeah, it, it does have a it does have a resolution, but but definitely not a good one. Um, <laughs> I mean, but certainly certainly good for, for some of the people involved, but far from an ideal solution. Um, to be honest, that story I mean, there is very much an immigrant line to it, but that was more I think framing the idea. I even though I you know British grew up in England and now I'm Australian. I'm frequently appalled by so many things in America, um, and America has such a massive cultural imp- sort of impact on on the Western world, Western literature, and Western pop culture. Um, and this idea, and you see it time and time again, this idea that um, you, you you can die of a very curable illness purely because you can't afford um, the medicine or the treatment or whatever. You know, I I grew up in a country with the NHS. I live in a country now with, with Medicare. You know, universal healthcare is absolutely doable and most places do it. Um, you know, most most developed nations have some level of care for their population. Um, and so this idea of this poor bastard with a sick daughter who basically got this amazing talent that costs him, literally costs him life with every time, you know, he will continue to to do this to keep his daughter alive, and this is what's required of him in this, you know, in America, um, where it, which it just shouldn't be, but that's what he's prepared to do. And you know, all the people coming up to him and you know taking, you know, benefiting from this this ability he has are just oblivious to the cost and oblivious to the reasons. And um, it's a very short story, but it was very much um, sort of grew out of my anger at that idea that some people just aren't looked after. Um, and that's often, of course, the immigrant experience as well. So, yeah. So do you find at times then that when you kind of sit down to write a, a short story, sometimes it is just something that you're, you're really upset about or, or something like that, and it really motivates you to, to frame a story around that kind of question or, or something like that? Yeah. yeah, it can be. It can be. There's uh, a few times where if I, you know, I find that, I mean, we, we sort of bleed on the page. So if, something in some way is wounding me then that's that's kind of how how i treat the wound is to explore it in a story um and sometimes i might have story ideas and start writing a thing without realizing quite what it is that i'm so annoyed about that particular time until i recognize the themes coming through um but yeah a, a lot of the time and you know with with that particular story the two ideas came together the um the idea of this guy's ability and the fact that people would just use him up for their entertainment was the initial sort of idea. And then as it, as in writing it, I, I then um, realized that actually I'm, I'm also talking about a lack of healthcare here and, you know, a lack of care for, for a populace. And, and that was, it was, that obviously came through subconsciously by the end of the story. I, I knew what I was doing and, and wrote it that way. But yeah, it initially came through from people just, you know, there were people with beauty inside and these amazing talents who just get used up by other people without any yeah yeah so it came, it came from a couple of different places but yeah all, often it's stuff that's bugging me I guess and then that catharsis of, of putting it through the page is what kind of what helps me deal with it and often as I say not consciously you know I realize in the process of writing or afterwards that that's what I've done I'm, I'm wondering too with the, the language that you've used specifically uh with describing how you kind of written it, that you bleed onto the page and, and connecting it to entertainment as well, if it's not also kind of a, a meta narrative on writing itself, as you're kind of translating some of your own ideas and experiences uh, onto the page for, for consumers' production? Uh, do you yeah, see a kind of connection there as well? In some way, I think there is to some degree. To some degree, like you, you, do, you do kind of open a vein each time you write something if you want to write something that's sort of really authentic and has some some weight to it. If you really want to tell a story, you have to live that character's 
story to, to do a good job of telling it. And so in the process of that, you have to sort of open yourself to, to be those characters and to consider their actions and the consequences of what might happen to them. So yeah, it, there, there is a certain amount, there is a cost in some ways to writing. And, and quite often I will end up taking a, a break of, of days or even a few weeks sometimes where it's like I'm just I've, I'm not writing anything for a while I've, you know I've kind of I'm a husk at the moment you know I've kind of emptied too much of myself out in, in this process which is good because it's cathartic it's what I do it's, it's how I function I don't know a different way but sometimes I have to remind myself okay yeah, I need to take a break and I'll I'll walk the dog on the beach and I'll go for a long motorbike ride and stuff like that and I'll take some time away from it and, and just refresh the wells and I'll take in some entertainment by other people and um, yeah, sort of sort of fill up again. But yeah, there is, there is a cost to it to some degree, but that's because I want to give what I've got to, to make a good story. And I think that's kind of, I think that's sort of what's required to make good stories. You know, you've got to sort of lay it all out there, you've got to lay it all bare. That's, that's I think that's pretty, really insightful actually uh, towards the the kind of whole process because I mean, there are a lot of a lot of writers who do need to take these kind of big breaks, and some people get, uh, you know, unhappy. Uh, a few days, a few weeks, it can be it can be longer, it can be less. Every person is is ultimately different, but it, it does kind of point towards why that does happen, right? And yeah, I think yeah. I think that's why it's uh, it's such an interesting story since we can talk about it about it on so many different levels on healthcare, on uh, how how it is to to be kind of an entertainer or, or how it is to function at at your job that maybe is is kind of sucking your your the life out of you, uh, so yeah. to speak. Um, but overall, in Crowshine, it it really varies a lot in its content, and it's not like I could draw one single thread or line through it and say like this is what Crowshine is all about. Uh, but at the same time, part of that has to do with the fact that many of the short stories were published at other times in your career. And they are kind of brought together into a single in a single work, uh, but several were originals. And I'm I'm very interested in the original stories because I think when you make a collection, the originals are are doing something right. They're kind of acting as a bit of a bridge or or, or something. And I'm yeah. wondering how how those original stories uh, entered that collection, and and maybe if you intended them to tie it together thematically in some ways, or or what their function was. To, to some degree, and to some degree, um, credit goes to the publisher as well on that front, because when um, I started working with Ticonderoga Publications, because Crowshine's my first collection, I've got a second collection now called Surf Coal, um, which came out about three years after Crowshine. Um, but Crowshine was, was my first collection. I think a lot of people, when they write a lot of short fiction, they have this idea that it'd be great to release a collection, which it is. It's a, it's a cool thing to have, um, but you can't you can't just write 10 stories and then release a collection of 10 stories necessarily. Um, so there's, uh, I think 19 stories in Crowshine, but I had probably 40 or 50 stories published by the time we got round to working on a collection. And that was when, you know, the publisher came to me and said, Hey, you know, we'd really like a collection of your work. You've been around a while now. We think, you know, and we worked a lot on picking the story. And, and so we looked through, through my, um, catalog of work uh, and it was very easy to put aside a few things you know because I've written some very much science fiction um, and you know some bits and pieces that were very much outside what I normally do so very easy to sort of cast those aside and then we end up with this you know list of I don't know 25 stories or something that were and then we kind of whittle those down to find stuff that really resonates well together. And that, again, with that, the publisher should have uh, some credit there. Russell B. Farr was the editor with Ticonderoga working on that. Um, and he was like, you know, these, these stories work well together. These are the good stories. Like, this is a good story, but it doesn't fit with this book kind of thing. And between us, we worked on that. And as far as I'm concerned, whenever you release a collection, it is mostly reprinted work from previous publications. And a lot of people won't have seen all of it, if any of it, depending on what they read. Uh, but if you do have sort of a, a fan base who do tend to follow most of what you do, and if you release a new book, you kind of owe them something new as well. And I think all collections should have a few new things in there that's never been published elsewhere. Um, and both my collections now, there's 19 stories in Crowshine and 16 in Surf Cold, and they both have three stories that were not previously published. 
um, that, are, that were brand new just, just for the collection. Um, with Crow Shine, the title story, Crow Shine, was one of them. Um, and I'd written that story before we put the collection together, but I hadn't published it. I, I hadn't sold it anywhere yet. Uh, when we started talking about this book and it started coming together, I was like, oh man, I've got, I've got a really great story that we can put in as an original to tie this together. Um, which the publisher then got right behind the net. We ended up naming the collection after it as well because it worked as well as it did. Um, and then the other two stories were sort of written with that sort of in mind, like they were stories that I wanted to tell, but they were stories I, of the many ideas I've always got going around and the many stories that I want to write. I wrote a couple that would fit with the rest of what this collection was shaping up to be like. So. Yeah, hopefully that cohesion then does sort of show through. I, I do think that there is a cohesion in, in feeling and atmosphere that really does work uh, throughout Ooh. the works. Um, when I when I was referring to like uh, common threads, I guess I was thinking more of like uh, specific content because we, we have a session that we're developing on short stories and anthologies. And it's, it's very intriguing how uh, when poetry collections or short story collections are made, sometimes they really just zo zoom in on like one thing. Um, and perhaps Serve Cold does that. I'm not 100% sure. Haven't read it. It's, it's to be bought by me eventually, but uh, <laughs> I'm guessing that that does have something to do with revenge then, right? Yeah, well, yeah, to some degree, um, yeah, more so. I mean, Serve Cold probably leans a little more towards horror, whereas Crow Shine maybe leans a little more towards dark fantasy. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that sort of revenge and consequence theme does crop up. Um, more through the course of Serve Cold, but also I kind of deliberately subvert and play around with that expectation as well. Um, but again, it was, there is a, uh, it is a, also built from the fact that I ended up with that many more published stories. It's like, I've got enough stories now for another collection. And we find the ones that work as well as they can together. And we, you know, that makes the next collection. With the gulp that's just come out now, that's five original novellas that haven't been published anywhere else, deliberately set in the same place, deliberately tying together like a mosaic novel. Um, that's the first time I've ever written a series of stories <clears throat> designed absolutely to work together, even though each story is quite different in its vibe. Um, that was a very much a, a, a conscious decision to make a set of stories deliberately to work together. And I didn't publish them anywhere else. They were all original to the book, so it's entirely original to the book. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the difference between something like the Gulf and with Crow Shine and Serve Cold that are collections that are sort of the natural marker points of my career as I go along. Enough stories come along and you gather them. You know? Right. Uh, that's that's really uh, something that we're probably gonna we might have to clip that or something as part of a discussion on it because we think that it it is really intriguing and insightful to hear how the publisher comes together, but also how how the author actually views it as. It can be viewed as like a, I guess, as a kind of stepping stone in the career, but also as a way of measuring, uh, really, a body of work and and kind of selecting and 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 really raising up and highlighting some of it. One of the stories in Serve Cold um, was one that we were going to put in Crow Shine and decided didn't fit, and I was like, ah, oh, it's a shame. And I like that story. It's a shame it didn't make it into my collection. And then I got to do a second collection, and it did fit a bit better. It's like, oh, cool. I, I did get to collect it after all. So, you know, even though most of the stories in Serve Cold are since Crow Shine and since I wrote those stories, some of them predate. So, you know, there's a bit of back and forth as well. So, yeah, it, it's a nice way to showcase, you know, the, your sort of progress as a writer, but also to, to reflect on where you've come from as well. Absolutely. And uh, I, I want to move our, our final questions are kind of about the, the story of the Rue, um, which... Uh... <laughs> I think is is very interesting just in general. It's it's an idea that I think I, I can't really think of, of very many examples that are similar to it, and it's a kind of uh, tongue in cheek horror, uh, especially because of its uh, or origin story that you share in the introduction. Yeah. Uh, and we're kind of wondering about the the writing process for that kind of novella, and and maybe you've kind of already telegraphed that a little bit, but I, I'm curious. Yeah, I, there, we, there is with. With this one, this was, I mean, all right, this was a weird situation, still is a weird situation. It's such a popular book, it's so cool. And it was, it was just, yeah, it was just a gag, it was just for fun. Um, 
uh, but it, it is also uh, to some degree a serious book and it, it worked because um, when, when the whole thing came up, I'd had this idea that I'd been knocking around it. I've got, I've got these files of notes where I jot down things and ideas I want to play with and themes I might want to look at or themes that I want to find a way to put into a story sometime and this, that and the other. Um, and one of the things I'm sort of very much aware of, because I live in a, in a, in a harbour town in country New South Wales, but not especially isolated. I'm a couple of hours south of Sydney, but I'm, you know, we're surrounded by towns and suburbs to some degree, but I do get a bit of that small town vibe where I am. Uh, but I've travelled a lot of Australia and I, I love these sort of remote places. Uh, but Australia, like a lot of places, but Australia does have a real issue around um, domestic violence and especially in connection with with isolation. Um, and it's something that I knew I'd been sort of wanting to explore one way or another. And I've touched on in a few different stories, you know, the, the story, the title story in Surf Cold explores that a little bit to some degree. And there's a few stories I've done over the years where I've nudged into it here and there. Uh, but I wanted to try to write a story that that was basically um, a sort of a horror story, like a monster story set in a tiny little remote outback town. Um, that I could use to kind of bounce these ideas of domestic violence back and forth against, you know, you know, what is the monster, what creates the monster kind of thing, you know, because, you know, oh, Bruce, he's a great bloke, but, you know, then he shoots his wife and kids one day, and it's like, well, he was such a top bloke. It's like, well, no, he wasn't. He just killed his wife and kids. You guys messed up. Um, you know, so what is it that, what, how does the monster hide and what brings the monster out and all this sort of stuff? And I knew that there was, there were these ideas to some degree that I wanted to explore. Um, and so I had this sort of loose framework for a story that wasn't really coming together. So it was why it was still in the file. You know? I was waiting for it to sort of to coalesce these things tend to marinate for a while, quite often before they get the page. And then this whole thing blew up about people making this joke and doing this mock cover and saying, oh, you know, the Roo, the killer kangaroo, you should write the story, you're the Australian. And, um, and it occurred to me at the time, I was like, well, actually, I don't need to be super serious about the story. It's a very serious subject matter. But, but I don't really have to be super serious about the story. I can, I can use those sort of ideas I've been nudging around. And instead of trying to figure out what the monster is, just, just throw in a demonic kangaroo. I mean, far out, that would just be, just make it gonzo, you know, make it this mayhem sort of fun. Like Razorback, you know, that Australian movie about the massive killer boar and stuff like that. Just, just run with that B-movie horror thing and just see where it goes. And I can just kind of use that story that I had in mind. I can just use that as the framework. It's just something to get me started. So it's not simply just a killer kangaroo, but you know, there's a bit more of a reason for what's going on. As it turned out, I ended up realizing that I managed to sort of use that skeleton to build a much bigger story than I realized I was going to. Um, and so even though it is this kind of comedic, over the top gonzo splatterpunk kind of story. Um, you know, that core of something serious is what holds it together. So yeah, it kind of works out. Do you think there's like a connection between like the choice of using a kangaroo that, that is kind of maybe hinting at or, or pointing out that anxiety that still kind of exists uh, for a lot of people with regard to the natural world in Australia? Yeah, maybe, um, maybe, I don't know, not consciously. Um, Cause I mean, really it, it, you know, I can, I can try to be as, as clever as I like, but it really did just come from a news story about this great big muscly red roo that was just digging up people's gardens and, and like chasing people down the street, which is, you know, kind of hilarious, but they are brutal. They're terrifying things if you get close enough to realize what their claws and feet and stuff are like. Normally they're pretty classic, so it doesn't matter. You know, they're these little herbivores. Uh, somebody once described, you know, kangaroos are basically the Australian version of deer. Um, and it's kind of a bit like that, but, you know, if you piss one off, they can get aggro. Um, but I, I think as well that, that, like, inadvertently, the kangaroo is such a part of um, the, the Australian identity. I mean, you look at the Australian coat of arms, it's got a kangaroo on one side and an emu on the other. It's like, it's, nowhere else has them. So, yeah, very much Australian mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you yeah, sort of, you know, national identity. So you start corrupting that, you're going to upset some people, but you, you know, yeah, how, how, can, you, how can you not? 
And I mean, you use you've used the Australian landscape and setting, and and kind of the bush or or the idea of uh, these rural towns uh, quite a few times in some of your short stories, but also in the Rue. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you feel is like especially uncanny about uh, the Australian landscape from your POV. Yeah, definitely. It's um, I, I've traveled a lot of Australia, um, and it a lot of the time people don't quite have a concept of just how big it is like if you if you overlay australia on europe um you could put perth on dublin and sydney would be on moscow like it's it's huge and it's made up of seven states and territories um so you know there there are cattle stations in west australia about the size of texas it's it's the, the, the distance is a vast um and most of the population lives on 10% of the land mass around the edge. And you know, the entire population, if you, if you took the population inside the M25 ring road around London, and, and that's the entire population of the continent of Australia in terms of numbers. So we, and, and that's because most of the middle, or, or not most, well, I suppose most, and like a, a huge amount of middle is basically inhospitable. Um, and so you end up with these vast distances between things, you end up with, um, states that are anything from like tropical North Queensland to the West Australian desert to Tasmania that's got a almost European sort of climate because it's that far south. It's, you know, equivalent of almost Britain North, almost. Um, and so every region and area is almost like a different country. When you travel through Europe and, you, you know, one country is different to another is different to another. You can travel through five countries in a day and they can be culturally and even geographically and architecturally and everything different. You can travel that same distance in Australia and not only still be in the same state, but not have seen more than a couple of towns. Um, and so there's that, that nature of just distance and space between things and all the people crammed around the edge in the cities and the towns where there are people. It's, it's fascinating to me that, you know, the, the, the way the landscape has shaped the country. Um, is, is quite something when you look when you consider the fact that you know the the original owners of Australia have been here for tens of thousands of years and then um, you know the the colonial invasion came along and we just kind of changed all this nice damp edge to ourselves that you go into the middle and there's towns dotted here and there but otherwise there's these great swaths of land that you know we can't survive on but people have been living there for, for tens of thousands of years all those sort of it seems almost contradictions and juxtapositions are fascinating to me. Um, yeah, the, and the fact that we you know we have mountains and deserts and seas and harbors and it, it's yeah, it's it's quite amazing. I wonder if part of that vastness or or the uncanniness of it maybe has to also just do with how map projections of Australia, you know, when we look at the Mercator projection, for example, Australia doesn't look that big. Uh, but when we we know the actual size, it's it's so vast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wonder if that's not part of it too. I, I I didn't even when I was first here, I still didn't quite. I mean, I first came to Australia. I came to Southeast Asia. I've been travelling a long time. I arrived in Darwin, and we drove down through the middle and back up and across Queensland and down the coast. And we just spent weeks doing it in a camper van and a few friends. And, but even then, I still didn't really conceive. I knew they were these vast distances. We would plan between roadhouses and, and just in case we needed to buy an extra can of petrol in case we wouldn't make it from one to the next. So you're aware of the fact that there's these great distances. But the thing that really put it in, into perspective for me is if you look at a map of Australia and you've got sort of Sydney here and Melbourne here, just this tiny little corner of this huge continent, but you could fit England between Sydney and Melbourne. And this is the rest of the continent. And so it, it was that that really made me go, gee, this place is massive. Because I would ride my bike from London to Ayrshire, not, you know, the other side of Glasgow. Um, it would be a 10 hour ride and I'd do it and I'd hang out with mates up there and I'd go up into the highlands and stuff like that. That was the entire length of my country where I grew up. And you can, and you can fit it into this, the entire thing you can fit into this tiny little corner of this massive continent. And, so yeah, that, that's kind of what drove it home to me. And so just scale and vast areas of nothing <laughs> or seeming, seemingly nothing is, uh, is amazing to me. It's, yeah, yeah, I find, I find it fantastic. 
Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's really good insight because we do talk about the Australian Gothic and how it is related to these feelings of uncanniness connected yeah. to the Australian landscape. So I think you really are highlighting, I guess, one of the ways that how that kind of becomes a factor, really, and why it's it's so unique when you do read Gothic or horror literature from Australia, uh, that it does have this kind of relationship to the land that's very different than what you'd say from like the traditional European context. Yeah, yeah, and, and this is why um, with that why I went ahead with the Gulf and this little isolated harbour town on on the coast, miles from anywhere, and why the Rue I think has the impact that it does because it's this little outback town that's like basically like an island in a desert almost. It, we need to tell these stories because these sorts of places, these sorts of landscapes and settings are, are not familiar, even though in Australia we consume so much European and American culture that we're so familiar with those countries and those cultures and landscapes and whatever else. The reverse isn't true. And so people in Australia, they, they see Crocodile Dundee and that's what they've got. You know? They think, okay, there's Steve Owen, there's Crocodile Dundee. And they, you know, people, when, when Sydney Olympics came around in, in 2000, um, we were frequently laughing about these lists people would share about questions from American tourists. And it would be questions like, you know, do they speak English in Sydney? Will we see kangaroos if we're staying at Darling Harbour, which is like in the heart of the city, miles from any bush? And, you know, are there ATMs in Australia? <laughs> things like this, you know, like it's so. It, while we're very much aware of Western culture, most of Western culture is very not particularly aware of, of us in any great detail. We're these kind of weird crocodile dundee people that live down underneath the planet. When, you know, the truth is you go to Sydney, you, you, you wouldn't really recognise much different to any other city in the world if you would just, if it was just paying superficial attention. You know, it's just like London or New York or whatever else, it's, but it's got an Australian vibe when you pay attention. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, I think it, I want to tell Australian stories because it's, the place is amazing, the culture is, is different, even though we are part of the Western canon, I guess. But yeah, it's, uh, it's I want people to start becoming as familiar with Australia as Australians are with America. I, I think that's a that's a noble and and also a very logical. I guess conclusion to our our interview in some ways, but uh, do you have any any last words you want to impart to to our listeners, whether they're they're connected to the course or otherwise? No, I don't think so. Just, yeah, just just speak out and read good Australian literature, especially good Australian speculative fiction. Yeah, like I said, we've got a lot of it. There's some really good writers working here. So yeah, yeah, come and find us. <laughs> I, I couldn't end on a better note, I don't think. So uh, read Alan Paxter and read read some of his recommendations as well. Um, right. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for giving us your time uh, with this interview. It's really meaningful. No worries. Thanks for having me. It's been nice to chat.